Thanks for joining us at Dream City Online. Stay connected by downloading the Dream City Omaha app. And don't forget to subscribe for all our latest videos. Hey guys, welcome back to Emotional Intelligence. This is week three of our journey through learning to steward our soul through the vehicle of emotional intelligence. This week, we're actually going to move into our second scale of emotional intelligence. We started out with self-awareness, unpacked that a little bit, walked through some practical strategies last week to help you continue to grow in that strategy. Today, we're going to introduce the second skill. The second skill is the skill of self-management. Now, here's what I want you to understand, because for many of you who maybe have made a career out of stuffing all of those emotions, not dealing with them, whatever the case may be, it may feel like at this point you've opened up Pandora's box, right? Like, great, now I've unearthed, I've become aware of all these emotional patterns and behavioral tendencies. What do I do with them now? It can feel overwhelming. I want you to know if that's where you're at, it's okay. Okay, that's completely normal. And here's what you need to know, is that awareness is not just for awareness sake. In fact, the reason that we've generated this awareness, the reason we've been excavating some of these things that, again, for some of us, maybe we've spent years, even decades, pushing down, ignoring, shoving to the back. The reason that we've brought all those things up is solely for the purpose of learning to become healthy managers. When we put language to those things, we can begin to manage them. In fact, one of my favorite quotes is by the beloved Mr. Rogers, who said, everything mentionable is manageable. And what he meant by that is anything that we can put a language to, we can learn to manage. So as we began to talk about, and, and we're throwing around this word of self-management and becoming a manager, it begs the question, what does it mean to manage and how do I do that? Let's start this conversation out simply by defining this second skill of self-management. Self-management is defined as your ability to use your awareness that you've now gathered to regulate your emotions emotional responses to both situations and people. Let me say that again. It's your ability to use your awareness to regulate your emotional responses to situations and people. It's so imperative that we, we learn from the jump that regulating our emotions does not mean that we stop feeling them, okay? This is simply the skill where we learn to stop obeying them. One of the things that over 20 years in working with people has taught me is that oftentimes the reason that we struggle with manning, managing our emotions appropriately is not for total lack of effort, right? Like we actually do try, even if the people closest to us don't always acknowledge that. A lot of times we're, we're trying really, really hard to, to bring order in this area of emotional regulation in our lives. The problem is not usually with our effort, but it's, it's the approach that we take to it. And so what I want to do, really the way that I want to kind of roll this out and what I want to start with is, is first teaching you what management is not. Because the first mistake that we make when it comes to managing our emotions is that we misunderstand that word altogether. My, my goal, my, my aim really is to teach you how to become an effective self-manager but again, the best way for me to do that is to help you understand what managing is not. If you've ever had a bad manager, chances are you can say, well, I know I don't want a manager who does this. Maybe it's micromanaging. Maybe it's they avoid conflict. Maybe they never give you feedback. Whatever those poor management historical uh, experiences that you have, oftentimes we can identify. I don't want that, or that is a bad manager. So we're going to take the same approach when it comes to understanding and laying a foundation for what a good and healthy, effective manager is. I'm going to teach you what you want to avoid. Okay. So first of all, when we start to um, put this language around emotional intelligence, you need to understand that self-management is not 
about denial, okay? Now, denial, when it pertains or as it pertains to emotional intelligence, is typically characterized by this refusal to acknowledge that you're feeling anything at all. Okay? Now, this is an important distinction from biblical denial because typically we think of that in a good way, right? We're denying our flesh. And so that feels like a positive thing, whether it's sin, lust, greed, whatever it is. And please hear me. Biblical denial does have its place when it comes to our emotions, but it's not in the acknowledgement of them. You should remember by now or that... Being out of a touch with your emotions does not make them go away. In fact, it does enslave you to them. The Living Bible in Jeremiah 6.14 says you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. And so to effectively manage our emotions, we have to acknowledge them. I cannot overemphasize enough the fact that becoming emotionally intelligent And specifically, learning to become a healthy manager is not about becoming less emotional. We all have that person in our life or those people or we've observed those. Maybe it's a family member, it's the the crazy aunt or whoever it is where you often refer or when you're talking about them, so-and-so is just so emotional. Maybe it's your teenage daughter or your toddler. They're, They're so emotional Typically, when we're saying that, it's not an affectionate praise, right? Typically, when we're saying that, we're judging the lack of emotional regulation that we're observing. But it's not the fact that they feel emotions that we're judging. Typically, what we're judging is how they're expressing them. And so they're their expression of these emotions. But it's not the fact that they possess or they have capacity for emotion, Again, it's how they're expressing it. In fact, I would consider myself to be a highly emotional person. Every strengths or or personality profile that I've ever taken would indicate that everything about me is wired for emotional depth and intensity. And not only is my personality bent and wired towards that, but I'm also a high empath. So what that means is not only do I feel my own emotions, but I feel the world around me. And so I am I am literally bent towards this intensity of emotional capacity. I readily feel my emotions. I feel the emotions of all of those around me, but rarely when people are, you know, describing me to someone else, rarely, if I don't know that I've ever heard it said, that Angel is just so emotional. And here's why, is that I've spent a considerable amount of time honing the skill of healthy and effective self-management, healthy and effective emotional regulation, okay? And because this sentiment, though, of being overly emotional, tends to carry with it this this negative connotation. Oftentimes it's weak or it's like, well, I don't want that person making decisions or being a part of this conversation. When we want to correct that or grow in that area, typically then what we tend to do is we think that we need to stop feeling, okay? This is not a sustainable approach to effective self-management. It usually does more harm than good. We learned in in week one that we are biologically wired, hardwired with the ability to experience and express emotions. And so to deny that we feel is to deny our humanity. Emotions are not a bad thing. They enhance our human experiences. They alert us to pain. They, they enrich our connections with others. And management executed in the form of denial will hinder all of that. So again, as we go into this and we begin to learn what it means to self-manage, you need to understand it's not about denying that you're feeling. So it's not denial, it's also not control. Once again, as a Bible-believing Christian, this can feel misleading. After all, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. This should be a good thing. This is not the type 
of control that I'm talking to, okay? When it comes to emotional regulation, the type of control that I'm talking about it is really control in the sense of being rigid or unchanging, okay? Rigid or unchanging. To illustrate this, think about, um, go back to like an intro to psych or science class, okay? And think of like the, the controlled variable in an experiment, this is the variable that never changes. No matter what, this one is constant, okay? So again, this, this idea of being rigid, there's no change. In our lives, control like this, control that causes us to be rigid and unchanging. Please hear me, that is a manifestation of pride rooted in fear. Okay, control that causes us to be rigid and unchanging is a manifestation of pride that's typically rooted in fear. Fear can be a fierce motivator and is a relentless nag. What that means is that fear will drive all of your decisions, but it will never bring you to a place of peace. When pride gains its its place in the equation, we stop or maybe we never started trusting the Lord. I can tell you from personal experience that on the other side of every single one of the deepest fears of my life, and by consequence, the areas I tried to control the most, was an invitation to trust the Lord even more, to go deeper in my relational intimacy with him. In fact, several years ago, I actually started uh, developing, not even developing, but manifesting some intense anxiety. And really, it surfaced in three particular areas of my life. It was my health. I kid you not when I tell you I had myself convinced that I was dying that uh, I was having these, these chest pains. And, and listen, I say all this as a Bible-believing, spirit-filled woman of God who has a master's degree in psychology. So I knew logically what I was dealing with and yet still was at the mercy of an emotional hijacking in this area. All language that you've now populated your vocabulary with. But in my health, I had myself convinced that I was had cancer. Most logical explanation, of course, was that I was dying. I was then overcome with this intense anxiety that my youngest child, my daughter, was going to die. That somehow um, the Lord was going to take her as having nightmares. You guys, it was crazy. And then the other one was that it was surrounding my marriage. And there was so much fear and anxiety in all of these areas of my life. And I began to do everything that I knew to do and finally got to a point where I had to get to the bottom of the barrel, deconstruct each and every one of those fears. And what I realized is that those were the three areas of my life that I did not trust the Lord. And so again, a lot of times when we try to control things, it's because these are the areas that we are not fully surrendered or trusting the Lord in. And this was debilitating for me, but this is the beauty of well-regulated emotions is that we can feel them and recognize them as indicators. They still hurt. They still oftentimes expose our insecurities, our vulnerabilities, those things that we just, you know, it's not my best version of me. I don't necessarily love that, but they play an integral role in the depth and the wholeness that we find in Jesus. I am not sorry that I walked through those valleys because I promise you, on the other side of that, there was such a rich faith and a depth to my relational intimacy with the Lord that I did not have before he allowed that alarm to go off and those emotional triggers to indicate, hey, angel, something's going on. There's an invitation here for so much more. There's a, there's a story in Matthew chapter 25 that really speaks to this same premise. It's about a businessman. He was going away on a trip, and before leaving for his trip, he brought some of his employees in, and to each one of them, he entrusted a measure of his wealth, a measure of resources. Uh, as the story goes, he gave one man five bags of silver, another man two bags of silver, and to yet another, he gave a single bag. The men who had been given multiple bags of, of silver immediately went to work and doubled their master's investment. 
The Bible says that of the man who was given one bag of silver, that at once he went away and dug a hole in the ground and buried the money. When the master returns and calls all of his employees back and he, and he demands that they give an account for what he had entrusted them with, he's pleased with the first two who were able to gain a return on the investment. But when he hears about the one who took his money and buried it in the ground, the Bible says that he actually became angry. Listen to this exchange. This is found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 24 through 28. It says this, Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, harvesting crops that you didn't plant and gathering crops that you didn't cultivate. Here it is. I was afraid that I would lose your money, and so I hid it, fear, control, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. The master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew that I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops where I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant, give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But for those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now, throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That feels so harsh, right? Like, gosh. And I think a lot of times we think we're doing God a favor when we control. Like, I've got this, don't you worry about it. I'm just gonna dig a hole and bury these issues. We're not, and in fact, we're working harder than we should be, and there's no return on that investment. There's so much for us to gain here. Whether it's because we don't, we don't trust the master or, or we're not sure how things are going to turn out, control, executed in response to fear, will never, never produce that desired security that we're working towards. And, and the lack of security that we really want is only remedied <clears throat> through that trust. And a lot of times, again, as, as with so much of our emotional formation, this dates back to those early years of our development. Because here's what you need to understand is that rarely are issues of fear and insecurity things that just resolve on their own, right? Um, fear is not something that you just grow out of. In fact, if you don't address these issues, not only do you not grow out of them, but you actually grow into them. They grow with you. There, there's some statements that I'm going to read for you, and you'll see how this just kind of matures with us. And, and these will start out really infantile and immature because these are statements that you would hear a child say. Things like, well, what if he or she doesn't want to play with me? What if I mess up? Well, what if they don't like me? What if I don't know how to do it? What if I, I somebody else is better than me? Listen, we can recognize those very childlike language, right? But now let me read you these statements. Well, what if I'm rejected? What if I'm a failure? What if I'm not worthy of love? What if I'm not enough? See, we see the evolution and the maturation of the language because we don't grow out of it. We just grow into it. If we don't learn to effectively manage these fears, what starts out as something surrounded by our performance, what we do, it really evolves into who we are. And these become assaults, not just against what we do, but our identity and our value. Here's what I need you to know is that control in the sense of being unwilling to grow or change is not the remedy to those fears. Control traps these fears and those lies deep within us to where those become our resting place. That becomes the norm for our life. Control is a counterfeit form of security. And really what it does is it moves us towards emotional lockdown, not emotional freedom, not emotional regulation. So control, or excuse me, management is not about denial. Management is not about control. The next thing I need you to understand is self-management is not about suppression. 
Okay, control I understand, denial I understand, but suppression is one of those like psychology textbook terms that yes, we hear it thrown around, but we don't really know what it means. So let's start with a working definition. Suppression, simply put, it is defined as the conscious exclusion of unacceptable thoughts or desires. And really, it's kind of like if denial and control had a baby, it would look a lot like suppression, okay? Suppression being this, this effort. I'm trying really, really hard not to think or feel the way that I'm aware of right now that I'm thinking and feeling. It's, it's exhausting. It's not sustainable, okay? And unlike denial, where I refuse to acknowledge the unwanted or un, unmanageable emotions, with suppression, I, I'm very aware of what I'm thinking, I'm feeling. Again, I'm just trying hard not to think and not to feel that way. And unlike control, where I just deem that nothing and no one will, will penetrate or influence my emotional atmosphere, when it comes to suppression, typically my atmosphere, my world, my environment is already plagued by those unwanted thoughts or feelings. The best way to put some skin on this is probably to think about a bad habit that you want to quit, okay? Let's take smoking, for example. Let's say that you decide that, you know what, smoking is really not healthy for me. I know that. I've known that for a long time. I've made the decision that I am going to quit. I am going to be smoke-free, the non-smoker, from this day forward, okay? So you wake up the next day. Nothing about your reality has changed except for the fact that you have decided that I am no longer a smoker. You wake up in the morning, typically as soon as you wake up in the morning, accompanied with your coffee, is that first cigarette of the day, but not today because today you're not a smoker. You go, you get in your car and you're on your drive to work. On the drive to work where you would next have that next smoke, you're not going to smoke because you're not a non-smoker. But all you're thinking about the entire drive to work is the fact that I am not smoking right now. Normally I would smoke, but I'm not going to smoke right now. You get to work. Okay, you go in. Your first break, it's at 10.15. Normally on my break, what do I do? I go out and have a smoke, but not today because I'm a non-smoker today. Lunchtime comes. It's the same pattern all day long, all day long. You you are thinking about the fact that I am no longer a smoker. I do not smoke anymore. Let me ask you a question. What is the landscape of your brain going to be populated? It's going to be littered with thoughts of what? Thoughts of smoking. But you're trying really, really hard not to think about the fact that you would normally be smoking. Listen, when we try to distract or substitute our thoughts and emotions without deconstructing their origin. Uh, we work considerably harder as managers than we should. This is why suppression, the, con the, the, the conscious exclusion of your present reality, is not an effective form of management. It often results in us giving up and quitting. Simply put, because it's exhausting, we just Start over the next day, try really, really, really hard. And we've all been there. I'm just going to will myself not to do these things. Sometimes it works depending on who you are, depending on what that habit is. But again, it doesn't have to be this hard. Biblically, what I want you to understand is that suppression is, is a partnership with darkness that's typically motivated by shame. Let me say that again because I want you to understand this. Suppression is a partnership with darkness that's typically motivated by shame. To people on the outside, maybe to those who are witnessing someone who is, is operating in suppression, someone who's trying really, really hard not to do this, this unwanted behavior or respond in this unwanted emotional expression, oftentimes it comes off as a form of pride but that pride is just the defense mechanism that's a response to shame. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, that once you were full of darkness, this is true of all of us, okay? Once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people 
of the light. Suppression does not allow us to live as people of the light because again, it causes us to try and deny the reality of that darkness. Remember, when the light does not cover darkness, light exposes darkness. But learning to live in the light can take time. It's not always easy and not necessarily because we want to continue in whatever that unwanted or unhealthy behavior is, but because we have to learn to manage our lives according to a completely different standard. We're learning to manage our lives in accordance with a completely different standard. And even that statement alone is a perfect segue, really, a a perfect transition into understanding what healthy self-management really is. Are you ready for it? Because self-management is not just some variation of denial or control or suppression. Okay, the key to healthy, effective, sustainable self-management is actually hidden in plain sight right in the definition of what it means to self-manage. Let me remind you, what does it mean to self-manage? It's our ability to use our awareness to regulate our emotional responses to situations and people. And the key that's hiding in plain sight right there is the word regulate. Okay, self-management is all about regulating. Okay, that's great, Angel, but what does it mean to regulate? To regulate simply means to make adjustments according to a certain standard to ensure accuracy of operation. To make adjustments according to a certain standard to ensure accuracy of operation. So the three essential components of regulating are the standard, the adjustment, and the accuracy of operation, okay? The standard defines both the adjustments and the accuracy of operation because without a definitive standard, we don't know what adjustments to be made. And when we're constantly changing the standard, all that does is create chaos and confusion. But without adjustments, the standard is meaningless because without the standard uh, to measure those adjustments against, we'll never know if we're operating with accuracy of operation. Think about it really uh, in terms of regulating the temperature in your home, right? Let's say um, wherever the thermostat is set, let's go with 70 degrees just to make it simple, okay? Based on a 70 degree standard, I am going to make adjustments. I'm either going to increase or decrease the amount of hot or cold air coming into my home, right? If I increase it a little bit, but it doesn't come up to 70, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna increase it a little more and a little more and a little more until that thermostat reads 70 degrees, at which point I will know confidently that the adjustments I have made have sufficed and the temperature of my home now accurately reflects the 70 degree standard. Okay, so when it comes to regulating our emotions, those same components will be required. We're going to need to identify the standard. We're going to have to purpose to make some adjustments according to that standard. And then we are going to regularly reflect back to that standard to determine whether or not those adjustments have resulted in in, uh, accuracy of operation, right? Do those adjustments now accurately reflect the standard? This is what it means to be a faithful manager, which Paul charged the church in Corinth with. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, he says, now a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. When it comes to the language of emotional intelligence. We are all called to be managers. And not only are we called to be managers, but according to Paul, we're called to be faithful managers. The task set before us is learning what a faithful manager is. It's it's learning to be healthy and effective as managers. And part of your orientation really into this management training is learning the difference between being a manager 
and an owner. Listen, as Christians seeking to steward our souls, please let me be clear. You are a manager, not an owner. You're a manager, not an owner. One of the best ways to understand this analogy, um, I remember teaching this the first time and just thinking about, this is kind of like sports teams. And so I remember, I'm like, okay, so there's sports teams and they have managers, but then I've heard the boys talk about there's an owner, so-and-so owns the Cowboys, so-and-so owns the Red Sox. I do know that those are different sports, just so you know. But I remember teaching this the first time, and John had just gotten home, and I'm like, babe, tell me, talk to me about the difference between uh, an owner of a team and a manager of a team. And this man was more engaged with the conversation that day than probably many of the ones that he comes home and is met with by me. But he was so engaged. And so, listen, I, I am not a super sports-oriented person. In fact, a lot of times, as sporty as I get is wearing tennis shoes with my jeans. And so for many of you who maybe don't eat and breathe sports like me, let me tell you what I have learned about the difference between a general manager of a team and an owner of a team, okay? For those of you, <clears throat> again, this is all new, here's what I know. A general manager does not own the team. There is, in fact, a separate owner. The owner of the team is the sole proprietor, and, and as such, they supply all of the resources for the team. The owner then appoints a general manager to manage the team. The job of said manager is to make informed decisions with the resources available to him from the owner. And to take those decisions and carry out the vision of the owner. Again, as believers, we are called to be faithful managers. But I feel it's necessary to let you know that according to scripture, again, you have an owner. Because we're not owners, we have to steward our resources well. Colossians 1.16 says, you were made by God and for God. 1 Corinthians 6 says that you are not your own, that you were bought with a price. Ephesians 1.17 says you've been ransomed through his son's blood. These scriptures, along with so many others, confirm the truth that, again, we are not owners. We have an owner. He is the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, the Lord of all. In and through his grace, he has appointed us as managers. And this distinction is so important for us to make early in our management training because as we progress through this emotional intelligence journey, it's going to be necessary for us to remember that we are not just trying to manufacture pleasurable emotions. We're not trying to fake happiness. Our job as a manager is never going to be to conjure up our own peace. Those are all resources that are supplied by the owner, and they, he, he will give us the provision that we need to make adjustments according to his standard. This distinction it is going to determine where we put our effort and energy. And as managers, we are going to do this in the most effective and healthy, sustainable way as we submit ourselves to the owner and learn to regulate our emotions. So this is our introduction to what it means to become a healthy and effective self-manager. As followed with the same pattern that we've been, next week we're going to unpack some specific strategies on how, where do I even start in this process of learning to regulate, of learning to make adjustments? How do I know if I'm doing it right? What's that going to look like? All that and more will be unpacked next week as we walk through some practical yet biblical strategies on self management. Here at Dream City Omaha, we're all about helping people discover Christ, recover identity, and uncover purpose. Please explore our past videos, sermon series, and online classes, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.